Welcome back. Okay, so we finished the sentencing phase, and here's where we stand. RCI has begun its term of probation, and Slick and Moneymaker have begun their terms of supervised release. RCI has revamped its ethics and compliance program, and they all lived happily ever after. But if it were only that simple. After the plea, but prior to sentencing, Moneymaker transferred ownership of his house to his second former wife. The house had been their marital, marital home owned in joint tenancy until the transfer. It has a market value of $500,000 with equity of $400,000. And during supervision, Slick filed for bankruptcy. Paul O'Connor, you're our supervision officer in this case. What's your role in tracking assets of these co-defendants? Uh, it's, it's a very important role uh, amongst uh, many other issues we uh, address during supervision. The probation officer serves as the eyes and ears of the court. Uh, we are to carry out the orders of the court. It's incumbent upon the probation officer to continually assess the finances of an offender. I choose what a, a multifaceted approach, if you will, uh, in my assessment and continued monitoring of the offenders. First, I'm going to look at the finances. I'm going to look at them pre-indictment. I'm going to look at the pre-sentencing phase, mm -hmm. post-sentencing phase, and in most cases, a, a post-incarceration phase. Mm -hmm to uh, see what the money was at the beginning and what it is at present. Uh, I'm going to identify uh, non-essential assets uh, to apply towards the monetary penalties. Uh, also, I'm going to look to identify possible movement of assets, uh, such as Mr. Moneymaker's movement of his home into others' names. That's when I'm going to turn to the uh, Financial Litigation Unit of the U.S. Attorney's Office mm -hmm. and assessing the need for a fraudulent conveyance action at that point. The second facet, I'm going to look at the future earnings of mm -hmm. that offender that we're going to have under supervision. Um, in the 11th Circuit, we do uh, have some leeway in setting the payments if the court has not specifically uh, set minimum monthly payments. So we're going to base them on the gross earnings or the earning capacity uh, for those offenders who choose to purposely limit their income. Uh, Northern District Georgia, we use a standardized payment schedule, which brings somewhat of a consistency amongst the offenders under our supervision, uh, once again based upon their gross income. The third facet is the continued assessment of the finances, at least every six months. Mm -hmm. On some of those cases, uh, I'm continuously doing it on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. uh, the routine uh, net worth statements follow up on those, cash flow statements. Uh, your databases, choice point searches, real property searches uh, to see if offenders have properties under their name, but also family members. We're going to look at the Secretary of State to see what kind of corporations have been formed in the past, what kind of corporations are formed in the future, once again under the in, uh, individual offender's name, but also the family members. I have found that a lot of the white collar offenders, they trust their family members and will place corporations in their name. Mm -hmm. Many times they will not step beyond that close circle. And uh, so uh, make sure we look at the family members uh, uh, in those databases as well. Uh, also, review those tax returns. Verify that that is indeed the information that was furnished to the Internal Revenue Service. Mm -hmm. uh, wealth of information on those tax returns when they are completed properly. Uh, some of the other areas that I always look at is if there's ever been mortgage applications filed. Okay. Why would you do that? That is important because the offender at that point in time, they are trying to convince the lender of their great credit worthiness. <laughs> so I want to look at those because that will a lot of times have a whole different story than what has been portrayed to the probation office. So then we have to determine now which one is the correct story. Okay. Um, also, I'm going to remain very vigilant on the self-employed offenders. That was what I wanted to ask you about and was hoping you'd be able to touch on because we have this guy, Moneymaker, who's got a condition in terms of self-employment. He seems to be the entrepreneurial type. Talk a little bit about that. The self-employed offenders are uh, the hardest to supervise. That leaves so much leeway for their ability to be creative. Mm -hmm. So much leeway for them to generate 
sizable income because a lot of these people are very capable people to generate income, but creative in where they direct that income. And in, when it comes to supervision, it's not usually income that's directed to the offender directly. Mm -hmm. So it's a constant test to watch what an offender is doing. And I personally, if at all possible, steer them away from self-employment opportunities uh, because verification is so, so important in supervision in this situation and many other situations mm -hmm. under supervision. So I don't, uh, if I can steer away from it and work with someone directly and know what the offender is really doing on a daily basis, I feel much more comfortable and uh, feel that everybody is going to be served more properly. One other aspect, which is really very elementary uh, as far as a probation officer goes, and that is the uh, very important home visit. Mm -hmm. And that is the continued assessment of the standard of living. Uh, look in those closed garages and see what kind of automobiles are parked in them. Uh, once again, it's an, just an elementary tool of supervision, but it's a very important uh, 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 tool. And, uh, and make sure you it. take note of the value of the television and VCR, I guess. That big screen TV. Right. right. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, you made reference to the financial litigation unit, so I want to turn to Tamara Fine and talk about, uh, or get Tammy to talk about your involvement at, at this stage and can you help? Oh, absolutely. First off, I have to say I'd be thrilled to get two solvent defendants in one case. <laughs> it would be incredible. Uh, we are very uh, in very close cooperation. We work with the, the probation officers. Uh, we have annual cross-training with probation and with the clerk's office and uh, Bureau of Prisons. Um, so, and, and I probably field at least a phone call a day from probation officers somewhere in our district. Um, we work uh, as essentially litigation support. Um, and we assist them in some financial analysis. Uh, while a person is on supervised release, it's really the probation officer's ballgame. So we don't do anything without speaking with them, but we're certainly available, um, for example, with regard to the uh, transfer of the property that Mr. Moneymaker was involved mm -hmm. with. Um, now, again, I'd be really surprised because in my experience, Mr. Moneymaker would have already transferred all his assets after he had his first brush with the law, and uh, the statutes of, limit of limitations for fraudulent conveyance actions would have already run on mm -hmm. all of those. But since he did this relatively recently, um, that would not be something that would be too difficult to, uh, to get voided, I would expect. Um, I would have to look carefully at how title was held, as you've already mentioned, and also whether there was some sort of um, separation agreement, a property settlement agreement in the divorce with right. his wife, because it may be, although the house was titled in both their names, she gave it to him as part of a property settlement. Depending on how it's titled and who was entitled to the property, um, I would try to recover half of the value, uh, possibly all of the value, again, depending on the facts. Okay. Similarly, the bankruptcy wouldn't concern me very right, much. Right. Uh, Ms. Uh, Slick has uh, declared bankruptcy during the course of supervised release. Um, I would uh, hope, and it, it would certainly be the case in our district, that the probation officer would immediately contact me, since I'm also the person who handles bankruptcy cases. Mm -hmm. And we would do a, a whole variety of things. First, because of the automatic stay, we would immediately cease all collection activity um, in the flu unit. <coughs> Secondly, Ex explain. Let me stop you there. Sure. And just explain the automatic stay briefly. The automatic stay is uh, essentially an injunction against collection action that goes into place automatically mm -hmm. when an individual files a petition in bankruptcy. Okay, and that applies to the government as well. It applies to the government if what we're doing is engaging in collection okay. activity. It wouldn't, for example, bar criminal prosecution. In some circuits, it wouldn't bar a false claims act prosecution, okay. but it would bar collection of the judgments received in either right. of those. Um, the second thing I would do is I would immediately um, go into the bankruptcy court, get a copy of the petition, the schedules, the statement of financial affairs, and I would put on my calendar when the first meeting of creditors, are, uh, sometimes referred to as the 341 meeting is, and either I or the probation officer or both of us would go to that meeting. Um, I'm looking for a couple of things here. I'm looking for any sort of activity, uh, financial-wise, that might make me question what's being done um, with the finances of this individual, uh, incurring a large amounts of debt, uh, attempts to encumber assets um, between the time, before the, before the government could get its lien in place, but for, for example, after um, entering into the plea bargain. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I would also be looking at it because I wear a different hat in my district, and I think a lot of flu, agent, uh, flu attorneys are also the bankruptcy attorneys and quite often the bankruptcy fraud attorneys are the bankruptcy fraud um, uh, coordinator in my case. And so I would also be looking at it, uh, as I do every bankruptcy I handle, to see whether or not I think that um, there's something uh, fishy going on, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when you have an individual who has a history of fraud. You have to be concerned about whether or not they're engaging in yet another fraud um, in the filing of their petition. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, but it's something that's in, in the back of my mind. Right. There was one thing that you mentioned that you kind of glossed over it, and I wanted to make sure um, that we uh, pinpointed it because when I was doing the research, putting together this program at the very beginning, spoke with several officers in the field who said, uh, who, who, who voiced frustration with the bankruptcy filing process? What do I do? You know, when one of the one of, one of my offenders under supervision files for bankruptcy, where do I go? Who do I talk to? Talk a little bit about that. Well, you, you come to your flu attorney because they are used to handling these things, uh, and, and one of the things will immediately put your mind at rest about is whether or not they're going to uh, the the defendant. We call them the debtor is going to be able mm -hmm. to get uh, the the uh, restitution order discharged. Restitution orders are not subject to discharge. What about fines? Um, to some extent, it depends. Uh, but uh, restitution orders, which is largely I mean, where the huge amounts of money are generally uh, coming from in all of these cases, okay. are not. Um, with fines, there are a whole variety of factors, including what chapter they're in. Uh, okay, going didn't mean to throw a monkey. That's okay. Uh, so it's more complicated. But again, okay. Your flu attorney will sit down, look at the facts of your case, look at when the fine was imposed, look at what it was imposed for, look at what chapter of bankruptcy the individual is in, and be able to work through with you whether or not something is uh, dischargeable in bankruptcy um, or not. And it, it may depend on what statute the fine was imposed under. Um, so I couldn't really talk about that in the abstract. Okay. But, uh, but the restitution isn't. And then the, the flu attorney or the bankruptcy attorney, whomever you get in contact with, will essentially hold your hand and walk you through the process. I would always file a notice of appearance in any of these cases so that I get every pleading that comes in the case. And that, again, helps me track what's being done in the bankruptcy. A lot of times it's very straightforward. A lot of times um, the uh, offender doesn't even attempt to discharge the restitution. He's really dealing with other obligations, and that's fine. Okay. But we want to keep a close eye on it. Very good. Uh, you've made reference to your particular district, so I wanted to turn now briefly to Stan Pfeiffer. Um, I know that you have a relationship with the flu unit in your district, and I was just wondering if you could talk about that, just so we could get an, a different perspective. Um, about two or three years ago, um, our flu unit and the probation office and, and the clerk's office uh, developed a inter-office inter working relationship and, and agreement, you know, um, similar to one that's being proposed by the monograph 114. And um, I think early on we were a little bit skeptical about this uh, uh, working agreement and, and identifying what each agency was going to do. In, in retrospect, um, it has been an excellent uh, opportunity as, as well uh, as an event for us because um, as probation officers, we have learned so much from the uh, assistant U.S. attorney and, and, and the paralegals in, in, the, in the flu unit mm -hmm. uh, helping us in, in terms of uh, knowing what we can and can't do in, in, in debt collection. Um, just getting to know them is very good um, and vice versa. They, they have a better understanding of our roles and and having that understanding in terms of how we work and then uh, and, and I don't want to I want to bring the clerk's office into this too um, has created a uh, a working relationship that has uh, um, increased like the amount of debt that we are collecting toward restitution and fine mm -hmm. um, I think last year we we quadrupled our, our monies in Nebraska mm -hmm. and that was just because of the the joint efforts mm -hmm. Paul what's the experience been in uh, in the northern district of Georgia we have uh, also developed a memo memorandum of understanding with the uh, United States Probation Office, the Clerk of Court, and the uh, United States Attorney's Office. The heads of each of those mm -hmm. departments signed off on it, and it was presented uh, and to the court uh, for its comments and review as well. Um, the idea is while all of us are working for the same common goal regarding the financial end of it and the collection of the debt, it basically uh, streamlined uh, a lot of processes um, 
we uh, really have become more efficient and effective. We've had great increases as well mm -hmm. in the collection uh, of fines and restitution. Uh, it's been, it's really been a good thing for, for all of us uh, because we communicate, we meet once a month and bring up uh, issues uh, to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, out of that, we um, began using the Department of Justice's U.S. Attorney's Office, the, uh, the billing system, mm -hmm. which the offenders are actually receiving monthly statements uh, like they would on a credit card statement. Mm -hmm. And uh, that always, that's been helpful uh, to us as well. So it's been a good fit for everybody. And um, it's like, a, it is consistent with the uh, criminal monetary penalties monograph 114 that uh, uh, all districts should get together and uh, work towards that common goal. Very good. I'm glad you mentioned the monograph 114 as well as um, the, we're also c considering here or concerned with the uh, financial investigation desk reference and I just want folks to take a note that um, we're hoping that uh, you all will or the field will um, take this program to consideration along with those two important documents and, and do your uh, training based on this as a package. Hopefully it will provide uh, a, a sort of a well-rounded approach to dealing with white collar and financial investigation issues and that kind of thing. I just wanted to make a note of that. Uh, Judge Forrester, I know you were involved in the front end uh, of the goings on in the Northern District of Georgia. I was hoping you could comment on that. The Chief Judge asked me to present them the program that Paul and the others came up to the uh, units committee which supervises among other things the activities of the probation office. And early on her concern, and I think it rose from uh, interaction with the clerk was that the clerk was a little prickly about this. Tammy, I, ha I found out that you've got a uh, silver bullet for bringing the clerk on board. Uh, you might want to tell everybody about it. Sure, I say to the clerk, I can make your life easier and they're always on board. Uh, it's actually remarkable how much we can make all of our lives easier when we communicate with one another. And it's really the, the critical piece uh, of, of, uh, of making the entire system work. In the clerk's office, for example, we're about to make a distribution in a telemarketing fraud case uh, to avoid the clerk having to sit there and have someone type in the names and addresses. We're providing them on CD-ROM so that they can simply be uploaded to the, in, into their computer. If we didn't talk to them, we wouldn't know that that was a problem and that we needed to address it. But the solution is really simple once we know that it's a problem. So it's critical to talk and to view yourselves essentially as a member of a team that's trying to, um, each with different responsibilities, but each trying to assist the other in the performance of their duties. Uh, along that line, I actually want to men mention one other thing. Um, oftentimes, we have probation officers who are having difficulty getting financial information um, out of individuals. Now, generally, again, we follow the lead of the probation officer, but the flu unit has a lot of tools available to obtain financial information, including uh, debtor depositions. And we will conduct debtor depositions in situations where we don't believe that the financial statements are complete and thorough and we need to follow up on, on those or we're not getting them at all. Uh, and if individuals don't show up for their debtor depositions, we'll um, summon them to appear before a magistrate judge and have their deposition taken that way. Yeah, okay. So it's a good tool for getting information if the probation officer is being stymied. Very good. Um, judge Forrester, any reaction? Okay. Um, I, again, in, we don't want to give our uh, corporate uh, or organizational co-defendant short shrift here, so I want to shift a little bit uh, our gears and turn to Marcelo Rodriguez. Uh, you are supervising RCI in this case. Um, one of our organizational co-defendants, RCI, uh, has a, a special condition requiring the development of a compliance program that actually works. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the guidelines that you would follow in supervising RCI and some of the problems that could be involved, especially in, in a case that of this level of complexity. Well, it, it becomes, Mark, a very complex issue because now the probation officer is ent entrusted upon uh, very fine and documenting uh, what the compliance program is all about. And uh, the organization itself has certain um, industry guidelines that the probation officer may be totally uh, clueless as to what they are. So it, it becomes uh, a, a, a process of educating yourself. Uh, ideally, you want to get the regulatory uh, officers or agencies involved in, in conjunction with the supervision process. Mm -hmm. uh, to a certain point, by having an independent auditor involved in the process with the expenses to be uh, paid by the organization would be uh, much more 
uh, efficient. Right, which uh, is what we've got in place here. For all the parties involved because right. he's to a certain point an expert right. and he can convey to the probation officer as to whether or not any irregularities once the compliance program has been uh, put in effect, whether or not there, there's any irregularities that are going on. So you can convey that to the court or at the same point correct those deficiencies that may be ongoing. Um, it's also important for the officer to take an active role. Mm -hmm. um, as it was said during the previous segment by, by Paula, if, if the compliance program has no backing from the top of the organization, it's pretty much a worthless program. So the officer needs to become involved, uh, attend, uh, if at all possible, the uh, board of directors uh, meetings, mm -hmm. make sure that the uh, items on the agenda concerning the compliance program are brought forth and through the uh, independent auditor, uh, you network and communicate and um, get a, a feel as to whether or not the organization now is in compliance with the program. So the officer, the supervision officer, really has to develop a significant degree of expertise in the industry in which the organization is involved in order to effectively supervise in, in the case of this level of complexity. That, that, is, that, is, correct. Okay. that is correct. Okay. Now, of course, there are other cases on the caseload, so I would imagine that perhaps there are other avenues um, that could be pursued. And Paula, I wanted to just turn to you. Um, to just get your reaction in terms of that level of complexity and what some of the creative alternatives might be. I'm pretty bemused, actually amused at the thought of a probation officer at the board of directors meeting. I don't think many directors would have, would be, they think they'd be very surprised to see who their new colleague <laughs> is. Um, which is why when we speak to organizations, we do remind them that they're better off taking a stab at running and having a good compliance program themselves before the government you know, comes in to help you do it. Um, that said, I think <laughs> Marcello's point is very well taken, that um, it, it is, I think, a virtual impossibility for a probation officer to try and be the compliance officer or to oversee a compliance officer for a major co company like this one, which has multiple units, probably different business units, some of which do health, some of which probably do manufacturing, et cetera. I mean, totally different, unrelated industries. So um, what I would have, what I would suggest, and I do suggest when we get calls about this, is that at the time, as a condition of probation, in addition to or as part of the package the, the, of the independent auditor, the auditor is really for financial. Right. But in many cases, the compliance doesn't go to financial irregularities. It goes to fraud. And that's a whole different area. And it also goes to changing a corporate culture on reporting and finding problems and bringing them to attention, which seemed to be the problem in this case. As nobody came forward, there were probably a lot of signs. Nobody stopped it early, and it became endemic and system systematic. So what I would suggest is that probation officers consider, as a condition of probation, asking the court in a complex case to actually appoint a monitor. It can be called a special monitor. It's done in all kinds of cases. And that person has the responsibility of assessing the compliance efforts and reporting to the court mm -hmm. and to the probation officer. But it keeps the probation officer available to do the rest of his or her job, which um, otherwise the, just monitoring can be a full-time job. And this has been done before. It has been done. Courts have done it um, successfully. It was done in the case of Con Edison the utility for New York City. Okay. Um, the probation, uh, the, the court appointed someone who had some experience in environmental matters, and he provided very detailed um, reports to the court, which are publicly available, by the mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Just very briefly, Judge, we've got about a minute before we go to questions and answers. I just wanted to get your brief reaction. Uh, how would you feel about uh, imposing that kind of a situation, or a, a, not a condition, but a circumstance uh, on a corporate defendant? I've had experience with monitors and receivers in a number of uh, different contexts, never this one. And I have found that if you're careful with selecting them, uh, they are a wonderful resource. Uh, the question I would have is who's going to pay them? Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, uh, I guess it's like a bracelet. You could impose the cost of the monitor on the defendant. Would that, would that be <laughs> the right that thing? That was done. And again, that was done pursuant to agreement. But it becomes, I think, to a corporate defendant, a much more palatable choice 
than having Marcelo sit in on the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tim Delaney, I saw, I saw you nodding. Uh, that, that's your experience as well. I know yes, I had that experience with healthcare in particular. I had a large scale Medicare fraud case in New York, and uh, the agreement was reached that the defendant would pay for the monitor. The defendant conducted the billings and their normal operations. The monitor had two people there full time who oversaw and kind of did spot audits on the billings. And we did that for a period of, I believe, nine months mm -hmm. till we were satisfied that they were on the straight and narrow and that their compliance program would work. Excellent. Uh, Marcelo, I gather. Just just to Please. to make a comment. Sure. Um, in the course of uh, currently supervising a corporation in South Florida, we've uh, implemented some of these guidelines as well. Um, I didn't actually meant to be physically involved in the board of directors meetings, but right. what we do is uh, the first item on the agenda is the issue of the compliance program. Right. So the officer physically goes prior to the meeting, gets together with the board of directors. And ensures their, that it's on the agenda. Exactly, or their representative. And then ensures that the uh, uh, items are, are, are carried out to, to make sure that the compliance program is being followed as, as required. Excellent. Um, Let's go to our questions and answers. Again, we've got a couple of faxes in from the field. The first is from Vanessa Thuman of Oklahoma Western, um, and her question is this. According to the additional facts of the sentencing, Slick, Moneymaker, RCI, and RCHS were each ordered to pay $15 million in restitution. Are we to, to assume this is joint and several? Somebody want to respond to that? Ah, Tamara, yes, thanks. I would assume that it was joint in several. I'd probably seek some sort of clarification from the court if it didn't specify that. Okay. But given that our loss is 15 million and that each of the defendants has been sentenced to pay 15 million, I think it's ra a, a reasonable assumption that it's a joint in several liability. And therefore, uh, any money paid by any one of the defendants will reduce the obligation of each of the defendants. Very good. Other reactions or? Tom? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, Another question comes from Renee Harriet, uh, supervising U.S. probation officer from the Southern District of California in the pre-sentence unit. Um, her, her, she prefaces her question with this. This is a restitution question. Um, the total quote unquote loss under the guidelines and per the facts in this case, and this goes to the facts that we've added in this discussion, um, has been established at $15 million. However, the plea agreement sets forth a lower figure of $5 million. Furthermore, the court, the count of conviction does not set forth an exact loss amount. For purposes of restitution, is the PSR bound by the $5 million stated in the loss restitution in the submitted recommendation for restitution, or is the $15 million to be the recommended restitution amount? What would the court do in this instance? Any takers? Judge Forrester, thanks for bailing me out of that one. <laughs> The court is going at the, at the uh, sentencing hearing is going to es establish the uh, amount of loss at the uh, in the count of conviction, and uh, you can't impose a sentence until you do that. So if you've conducted a proper sentencing hearing, that gets done, and that can be different than relevant conduct. Mm -hmm. So it's possible, and very frequently the case, that the uh, the loss amount in the count of conviction and the, re the relevant conduct number are different. That's fairly unusual, however, where you have a conspiracy or plea to a conspiracy because the loss amount and the, uh, uh, the loss in the count of conviction are usually coextensive, or at least that's the way we do it in our world. Very good. Any other reactions to Renee's question? No takers, huh? Okay. We have now reached the end of our third segment in the program. Um, I would like to thank our panelists for joining us. Um, uh, before we get to our closing, we first want to review our final set of learning principles.
Well, that brings us to the end of our program here today. It's been a unique opportunity to have so many perspectives represented at once, and we've discussed a lot of issues in the last two hours. But the reality is we've barely scratched the surface. This conversation about white collar crime is truly just beginning. If you're a district representative for this series, you can join our current online conference. But before we go, I would of course like to thank our wonderful group of panelists. I'd like to thank the participants here with us and those of you watching in the field. As always, if you have any suggestions for future special needs offenders programs, please feel free to email me at msherman at fjc.gov. Finally, remember to fill out and return your evaluations and rosters. Your feedback helps us improve the quality of our programming. Thank you again for participating in this special needs offenders program, and we'll see you next time.